1971 was an amazing year for music, so much so that Apple TV now has a show on called 1971, the year that music changed everything. I haven't watched it yet. I just seen it on my guide there. It's got Elton John, Graham Nash, Joni Mitchell, and Phil Spector talking about 1971 and how important it was. In 71, you know, I was like eight or nine years old and uh, I was listening to a lot of W-O-K-Y Mighty 92 in uh, Milwaukee during the day and uh, at night we got WLS from Chicago in really clear. Uh, so yeah, I probably listened to that at night and W-O-K-Y. A couple years later, I discovered uh, FM radio and WZMF 98.3 was my station. But I listened to all the top 40 stuff and these were my favorite songs from 1971. You know, I had gone into uh, Summerfest 1970, my, my first concert. Uh, was Sly and the Family Stone, so my musical ears were really starting to open up at this point, but I was still a little kid, so what did I know? 1971 was a weird year. It was the debut of All in the Family on CBS, the great uh, Down Goes Frasier, uh, that great Ali Frazier fight. Starbucks opened their first store. The Milwaukee Bucks won the NBA title. The Bangladesh situation, you had their independence, you had the typhoon, it was just a mess. You had the concert for Bangladesh, 71 was a big year for that country. Uh, Norway started drilling oil in the North Sea. Uh, Nixon declares the war on drugs. Jim Morrison dies, the World Trade Center, uh, the Twin Towers get finalized. Nixon takes uh, America off the gold standard and Stanley Kubrick releases Clockwork Orange. There were some uh, famous people born in 71. Kid Rock was born in 71. Denise Richards, Method Man, John Hamm, Selena, Shannon Dougherty, Elon Musk, Tupac Shakur, Missy Elliott, Jeff Gordon, Lance Armstrong. It was a cool year. Uh, we're not going to be talking about any of the prog stuff that came out in 71. I wasn't listening to prog in 71. There's not going to be Stairway to Heaven, Roundabout, Hocus Pocus. I did not include Carol King's It's Too Late because we had the album. Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. I didn't, I didn't know anything about Marvin Gaye when I was a little kid. It's not on there. Brown Sugar's not on there because we had the Rolling Stones LPs. So these are the songs I was listening to as a little kid on the radio and just loving it. And we're going to start with number 15. It's the Never Ending Song of Love by Delaney, Bonnie, and Friends. I love this song. I had no idea who did this one as a kid. I had no idea who they were. Uh... Delaney Bramlett uh, was the musical director of a TV show called Shindig, where he met Leon Russell. Uh, Bonnie Bramlett, she was the first white Iket for white uh, Ike and Tina Turner. Interestingly enough, she also uh, replaced Stevie Nicks at some point and recorded an album with Fleetwood Mac. She was also, uh, what else did she do? She was on Roseanne, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this song, uh, just incredible. So many people played with this group, Delaney and Bonnie, both Dwayne and Greg Allman, Eric Clapton, George Harrison, Graham Parsons, even Steve Howe played with these guys. Just amazing. The song hit number 13 in the U.S., and I love it. At number 14, it's Gypsies, Tramps, and Thieves from Cher. This hit number one in the U.S. It was released September 1st. This was her breakaway single. She was breaking free from Sony, Sonny Bono, so they brought in a new songwriting team, new producer. Uh, this song deals with racism, and uh, it's told from the point of view of a 16-year-old Romani girl who gets pregnant, and she's in prostitution. It's really crazy. Originally, the song was supposed to be called uh, Gypsies, Tramps, and White Trash. <laughs> Didn't quite work. Uh, yeah, you don't hear this song much anymore, do you? It's really probably not appropriate. At number 13, we're going with John Denver. He's going to West Virginia. It's Take Me Home Country Roads. This song was written by married couple Bill Danoff and Taffy Navert. 
Uh, they wrote it, and after they were done with it, they wanted to give it to Johnny Cash, but uh, John Denver heard it, and he knew that was going to be a smash hit for him. It hit number two in the U.S. It was kept off the number one position by uh, the Bee Gees. Um, West Virginia has now uh, adopted this song as its uh, state anthem, and why not? It's just awesome. I love it. It's it's so cheesy and corny, but it's it's just great. And number 12... Those Bee Gees we just talked about, the song that kept John Denver off of number one at that time was How Can You Mend a Broken Heart, song written by Barry and Robin, although Maurice has uh, been given songwriting credit you know, later on. This was the band's very first number one hit in the U.S., and it's really weird because it didn't even chart in the U.K. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, apparently, they recorded this song and Lonely Nights, the same night <laughs> they, they were in the studio. Wow. How do you record two amazing songs in the same night? It's pretty great. I love it. Number 11. <laughs> we're going to Chicago and the Shy Lights. Have you seen her? No, no. Tell me, have you seen her? I, am I going to sing every one of these songs? <laughs> October 1971. This song hit number three in the U.S. and the U.K. Uh... The following year, they would have an even bigger hit with Oh Girl, which hit number one. MC Hammer covered this song, uh, like, I don't know when, back in the 90s. It hit number four for him. These guys went to Hyde Park High School in Chicago, where they met. The song was written by Eugene Record, who's one of the... They all sang. There were like eight of them, and they all sang. They were all lead singers, I guess. Um, just an amazing song. I just love that spoken word stuff. You know, brings the old tear to the eyeball, talking about the one that got away at number 10. Talking about a sad song that brings the tear to the eyeball. How about Bread and If? One of the most beautiful ballads ever written. This is David Gates. Wow, what a great song. He wrote it. He sang it. He was originally from Tulsa, where he met up with Leon Russell, who seems to be everywhere in 1971. Uh, Bread was a soft rock band out of L.A., but they had a lot of really good songs. Baby, I'ma Want You, Make It With You, Let Your Love Go, Everything I Own, Diary, The Guitar Man, but If is the best song they ever did. It's just amazing. I just love it. At number nine, Put your hands in the hands of the man. Oh, it's ocean and put your hands in the hand. This thing hit number two in the U.S. I guess it was originally done by uh, Ann Murray on one of her albums, but this was a band called Ocean that did it. I just love this song, the boy-girl vocals. This was a time when you could have just an amazing chord progression and that be the whole driving force for your song. And that is absolutely what this is. If you don't love Jesus, <laughs> you know, you're going to listen to this song and you're going to have a different point of view for sure. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. This was a time when you could sing about Jesus and gospel music and people wouldn't look at you like you were a freak. At number eight. We're going with Three Dog Night, Joy to the World. This was uh, Chuck Negron singing this one. Apparently, both Danny Hutton and Corey Wells, the two other singers in Three Dog Night, heard the song, and they're like, uh-uh, no, 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 no. This was written by Hoyt Axton, the same guy that wrote The Pusher for Steppenwolf, which I did not know. Uh, this song hit number one in the U.S., which made it a, a very interesting case where Hoyt Axton and his mother, May Axton, are the only uh, mother-son team uh, to both write number one hits. May wrote Heartbreak Hotel for Elvis, so that's kind of cool. At number seven, it's the five-man electric band and signs. I love this song. I mean, look at my hair. How could I not love this song? It was released in May 1971, written by Les Emerson, one of the dudes in the band. Uh, they were Canadians. They originally went by the name The Staccatos. And what's interesting, in like 1968, they did a split LP with The Guess Who, where The Guess Who were on side one and The Staccatos were on side two. Very strange, very strange stuff. But this was originally a B-side. Uh, Hello, Melinda, Goodbye was the A-side. But some smart DJs in the U.S. picked up on the B-side and they did the old flipper in short order. Song hit number one. It's amazing. I love it. At number six, 
It's Paul and Linda McCartney and Uncle Albert, Admiral Halsey. This is a song that continues Paul's prog rock uh, experimentation. Apparently, this song was made up of bits and pieces of stuff he was working on when they were doing Abbey Road, and it certainly does have that same kind of feel to it. This hit number one, and it was the very first gold record for Paul McCartney as a solo artist, and it's just amazing. I, I really love that song a lot. At number five, we're talking about Superstar by the Carpenters. Karen Carpenter, what an amazing voice. This song was written by... Uh, Bonnie Bramlett, whom we just talked about, and Leon Russell, Delaney and Bonnie ha uh, had recorded this, and it showed up on a B-side, but apparently Richard Carpenter saw Bette Midler performing this on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, and he realized he had to do a version of it. They changed a few things around. Um, the chorus does not start the same way. The Delaney and Bonnie version starts out, the chorus starts, baby, 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 oh baby, which doesn't make any sense to start a chorus. They sharpened it up and now it starts, don't you remember you told me you love me, baby. Much better way to start a chorus. They also changed the words around. There's one lyric about, I can't wait to sleep with you again. And uh, the Carpenters changed it to, I can't wait to be with you again. Um, yeah, yeah. The chorus also had a little bit of uh, chord changes in there where that final line is not sung by Delaney and Bonnie. That, I love you. I really do. That's not in the original. It's weird. But yeah, this is just one of the best songs ever written. I just love it. It's incredible. The orchestration is so well done. But when that chorus hits and you've got the tambourine going in the left ear and that trumpet in the right ear, it's just powerful, man. It really is at number four. <coughs> Excuse moi. It's Harry Nielsen. And Without You, a song written by the... Two dudes from Badfinger, they had recorded it, but Harry Nielsen had to smash it with it. This thing hit number one, both in the U.S. and the U.K. It was on his, uh, what album was that? Um, I can't even remember what it was called. Nilsson Schmilson or whatever. It's such a great song. It's another sad song. Uh, you have Gary Wright performing on this thing. You have Klaus Vorman performing on this thing. Um, it's just incredible. Uh, apparently, Harry Nielsen was... Uh, John Lennon called him the American Beatle, which is kind of fun, but for a guy who never toured a day in his life, he sure had a nice career. Oh, these top three are just killing me with how good they are. It's a toss-up. I do not know. I mean, I might as well just randomly... That's how good these three songs are. Probably the best year we've covered so far, just in terms of the quality of the top of this list at number three. Man, this makes me sad to put this thing at number three. It's Rod Stewart and Maggie Mae. Man, oh, I love that track. Just love it, man. When I was a little kid, I used to just go crazy when that thing got on the radio. This was another one of those flipper rooney deals. This was the B-side. A song called Reason to Believe was originally the A-side. They, they flipped it over. I guess they were thinking Maggie Mae doesn't really have a chorus. So, you know, it can't be a hit, right? Oh, <laughs> yes, it can be. That mandolin. Uh, Rod couldn't remember the name of the guy who played mandolin, so on the record it just says uh, mandolin by the guy in Lindisfarne. His name is Ray Jackson, and he deserves some credit. Uh, the song was written by Rod Stewart and Martin Quintenton, and it was released in July of 71. Oh, so good. Best song about a young dude losing his virginity to an older woman ever written at number two. Another one. How is this number two? How? American Pie at number two. It makes no sense. Man, that number one song must be pretty good, huh? American Pie, one of the greatest songs ever written. You know, all eight minutes and 32 seconds of it. It was so long that when they released the single, they had part one on side A and part two on side B. Radio stations were playing part A, but they got so many phone calls, people mad and upset that they started playing the album version. It was like the longest... Uh, 
longest song to ever hit number one. It was number one for four weeks. Uh, a couple years ago, Taylor Swift broke that record with All Too Well, her 10 minute version. That's an amazing song too. But we're talking about American Pie. Clearly the, the, the genesis of this song was the plane crash February 3rd, 1959 that took the big bopper, uh, Richie Havens and, and Buddy Holly. And that's why February made me shiver. Yeah, we understand that. This song's really about the loss of innocence and Don McLean tried a bunch of session musicians. It just wasn't working. He wasn't happy. They re rehearsed this thing for like two or three weeks. It all came together when they brought in a piano player named Paul Griffin, who would later show up on uh, Steely Dan's The Royal Scam. Uh, he even gets a songwriting credit. Uh, the Fez is co-written by Paul Griffin, and his piano playing does indeed make all the difference in the world. It's the glue that holds the thing together. So many illusions. Don McLean was, you know, real coy about explaining what the song was all about for years and years, but in the last couple of years, he's been opening up about it. He, you know, he talks about kings and queens, and that's Pete Seeger and Joan Baez. There's references to Elvis, James Dean, Bob Dylan, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, even the Birds, Janis Joplin, uh, JFK's assassination, the Manson family. He throws it all in there in one incredible song. One of the greatest songs ever written. That same album had Vincent, which was another amazing song. If I didn't have the one per artist rule, Vincent would have been on here too. But what could possibly be better than that? Well, there is one. Here it is. Yeah, it's John Lennon. It's Imagine. Why would it be anything else? You know what's weird about this is this song did not hit number one in the U.S. It only hit number three. That's bizarre to me. And it was not even released in the UK until 1975. Why? I don't understand that, where it hit number six. After Lennon was assassinated, they reissued it in the UK, where it promptly did hit number one. This was a song that, for some reason, was on uh, Clear Channel, iHeart Music, whatever they call themselves now. Don't play this song. Uh, I guess it's a little too uh, communist for those right-wingers over there. I don't know. Clearly, you had John Lennon singing and playing piano. You had Klaus Vorman on bass. And, of course, the late, great Alan White on drums. Just simply beautiful. Phil Spector produced it, but I guess he just kind of sat in a corner and stayed out of the way. Apparently, Yoko had more to do with putting this thing together than Phil did. But it's... Clearly one of the greatest songs ever written. I mean, you look at 1971, Maggie May, American Pie, and Imagine. I, I, yeah, flip a coin, flip yourself a three-sided coin, get one of them Dungeons and Dragons dice and, you know, figure it out that way. I don't know. Anyway, that is 1971. Oh, what a year it was. I loved it. And I love the songs from 71. I'll see you guys soon. Maybe we'll keep going with this. We'll see how the numbers play out. People haven't been loving this series all that much, but I don't care. I love it. Anyway, I'll see you guys. Have a great weekend. Peace in the Middle East. In the Middle East. <laughs>